Oh yeah, my name is Propaganda. I'm from uh, South Central Los Angeles. Uh, live in Long Beach now. Um, I've been doing full time like music and touring. Uh, how long, Bobby? It's been about maybe uh, maybe seven, seven, seven to eight years now. Um, as far as like this was my only source of income as like a full time artist. Uh, I'm part of a small indie label based in Portland. It's called Humble Beast. Um, we just a bunch of dudes that love hip hop and uh, um, give away our records and uh, and we hit the road hard. Mm. Yeah, dope, dope, dope. Adam, you want to Adam, you want to give a little bit more insight into your background? Yeah, um, I'm originally from Washington D.C. and I uh, live in Colorado. Went to school in Boulder. <laughs> And uh, just started out interning at the Fox Theater in Boulder and then kind of moved my way up and am now an owner and the co-ed town buyer of Cervantes in Denver. And we do shows across Colorado. And I also work for a management company in Los Angeles called Silverback and the company manages acts like Sublime and Slightly Stupid and I manage the, uh, the Grouch and Eli. Okay. We just got, we just got Webby on. Webby, hold What's on. What's up, man? What's up? What's going on? I appreciate you joining us. I'm just going to let Matt introduce himself, and then I'll, let you, I'll let you do the same. Cool. Uh, what's up, guys? I'm Matt Adler. Uh, like Dave said, I'm Funk Volumes booking agent. Um, I'm an agent at Paradigm, and uh, I started in the business as the concerts director at the University of Maryland, where I would bring artists to, to campus to perform for the students. And then uh, I went to a small agency right out of school called New Agency, where I became a partner. Uh, we worked with a lot of hip hop acts, including Chris. Yeah. And then in January, moved over to Paradigm, uh, which is one of the bigger agencies in, uh, in North America right now. And I've been loving it ever since. Dope, dope. Webby, man, it's on tour right now. Go ahead, introduce yeah. it. Yeah. Been a long day, long day. Uh, but I am Chris Webby. I am a uh, hip hop artist from uh, Connecticut and currently on tour for my debut album that just came out recently and just been moving and shaking and you know grinding for a long time been down with the fun volume homies for quite some time and adler good to see you again brother how you been been no good doubt. no yeah. doubt man cool cool so i i want to i want to just jump right in jump right in it and start with the artist right you know every artist wants to know how to start touring mm -hmm. um you know so it's it's never a situation where you just get out and just start doing a bunch of shows. No. So going back to the early days propaganda, um, what was it like? Like how did you start getting to a point where you eventually started getting paid for shows? Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh it was definitely a long road, a uh, very humbling road. Um yeah, you know, just being from LA, like I started off at just open mics. So like, you know, project load and like dim lights. Like I kinda came from kind of that kind of foundation elements just like the battle rap kind of scene um it's kind of where it started for me and that was like probably the biggest thing as far as like developing like a real stage presence and kind of like how to hold a mic no matter how good or bad a system is and just like having giving people a reason to look at me you know what i'm saying i think i kind of learned that in kind of the open mic scene so then when it was time to like step out to kind of do my own shows again it was like you know if you, if you, for me, it was like, if I put myself on the talent buyers, if I put myself in the talent buyer shoes or in the promoter shoes, it's like, well, why propaganda? Why you and not this cat? You know what I'm saying? So the thing for me was always like, I need to give you a reason to, to, to have a job description that only I can fill. You know what I'm saying? So it was, for me, it was like, you develop a, a, a presence like that. And then, so the first few shows was like, a lot of like bargaining where it was like, uh, you know, if I had buddies that were, uh, I'm not going to ride on your coattails, but like, how can I serve y'all? If it's like, okay, you finna go do seven to eight shows. Like, can I pay for 50% of the gas? You know what I'm saying? And, and in exchange, um, can I get 15 minutes? And I know that 15 minutes just being, you know, some, just having a good work ethic and a good, you know, desire to have that stage presence was like, I'm going to mark this 15 minutes and just and be the either the uh the most like helpful cat on this tour you know what i'm saying or the least like the least headache you know what i'm saying so um 
so so if i could if i just so i just kept a lot of times just really just kept just finding myself just like serving dudes and just like in what way can i help and position myself in a place to where you kind of create a demand and then and then and then later on we're talking like five years later was when uh i was actually on paradigm for a little bit um, now it's just funny. I'm on I'm on WME now, but uh, I was on Paradigm for a little bit. But it was like before, like a, a talent agency was like, you know, we want to work with you. It's like I I needed to give them something, give them a reason to believe that I'm worth their time. So it was really just like sucking it up and just being like the size of the show, the size of the crowd don't matter. The crowd they may not even be my fans, but by the end of this 15 minutes they will be. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like just that determination and work ethic of being like, I'll, I'll play the back. I'll serve, I'll clean toilets. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll do what I need to do. I'll set up merch. I'll work merch. If you just give me 10 minutes, you know what I'm saying? And just like, just that hunger, I think was like, for me, the first step. So you really became a humble beast. Like say you, word. <laughs> it fits. It fits yep. 100% why you yep. are. So what, so in terms of the length of time from when you knew you wanted to rap, to when you started getting paid for shows consistently, how how, how many years was that? Oh, uh, man, that was that was at least a decade. It was at least it was at least ten years before I was able to say, "This is my job." You know, I was right. I was teaching high school full time. I wasn't, and I was cool. Like I was enjoying it, just doing shows here and there. You know, and and uh, but then there came a day where the demand was was high enough to where I could legitimately be like okay, I'm paying my rent, you know what I'm saying? I'm paying my school loans and um, I'm doing music. But it, for me, it was like, I, I was just patient and just, because it's, it's it's all, it's just time. It's just hours. So, so if it's a matter of just, if that's all it is and everybody got the same 24 hours, then I'm just going to invest mine in something I know I want to do. And that was just kind of the attitude about it. Right. Dope, dope. Yeah. Webby, what, what was your experience like in the very early days? Like, you know, getting up to a point where you started getting paid consistently for shows. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a rough road. That hunger is is essential to really get going. <laughs> if you don't have that fire in you, you're in the wrong job. You, you know, well. a lot of work for sure. But um, it uh, I remember it kind of picking up after my first official mixtape. Um, you know, getting booked for like graduation mm -hmm. parties and sweet sixteens and shit like that, which was uh interesting. But it, it did, you know, pay the bills at the time. Right. And uh, it got to a point where, you know, my buddy was the one fielding all these booking emails. And I mean, he's just like was a friend, you know, fellow stoner who, did, you know, did not have the capabilities to really kind of carry all that and make it put it all together. And then um, started working with new agency when the demand was high enough and, uh, you know, got on the road. But when it comes to. That, that early stage before you're getting paid to do shows is so essential because you learn all the tricks of the trade, um, at least some of them. I learn something new all the time um, to this day, and I've probably done upwards of 300, 400 shows at this point. So, um, right. But that, that those first few shows is so important to really just learn um, how to perform because you may be nice, you may be able to rap, you may be able to put songs together, you know what I mean? You may be good on camera, but stage presence is a whole different yeah. thing. And you have to command a crowd of people for, you know, now my set is, uh, you know, like an hour and 20 minutes long. So yeah. you have to command a room full of people for for a long time. And that's that's a whole different talent than um, just being able to. <coughs> yeah, I, I, think that, sure. I think that the quality of the show is sometimes overlooked and artists just want to kind of get out there. Um, like what would, what would you guys starting with, with prop, like, what would you suggest, um, how should they start getting comfortable? Um, what should they do, um, yeah. to better their show? Man, uh, I think that you, you can't, you can't ever stop being a fan of music and a fan of hip hop. I think you should be buying tickets to shows like all the time, um, yeah. seeing yeah. other acts in out in your genre outside of your genre people that you feel are like kind of at the same level um as far as like market share and just like hey what are they doing what can i could do to adapt it you know how can i do this better and just like being just brutally honest like we have i mean we have a team of dudes that just like are just pit bull just absolute dedication to excellence your feelings aren't spared like it just we just go in and you just 
you just have to be willing to take it. So I think that one is like you 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 create good art when you experience it. So like I think if you're if the more shows you go to, um, and you could say when you left it like. I didn't like that performance. Well, why didn't I like that performance? Well, damn, I'm actually doing the same thing that dude's doing. You know what I'm saying? So then you just, then the, then the reflections on you. So I think there's that. And then also like, um, just that, like, and for me, it was like, it, it's important to like have the, the, the possibility of taking the L where it's like, like just that, that tension of being like, I could lose right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, and like, like Chris said, where it's like, yo, it's a, it's an hour that's a lot of time, you know what I mean, to have people yeah. pay attention yeah. to you, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, well, what would I want to watch for an hour? You know, so if you can just, like I said, just be honest, go see other shows and like, and just, and, and invest in yourself. Sometimes it's really just like, man, is it like, are you really going to miss that? Like, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars to like buy some lights, you know what I'm saying? Or like, or a backdrop like are you are you really gonna miss that money you know what i'm saying like you're not gonna miss that like you're investing and again it's giving a reason to a talent buyer like this is this is why you should book me this is why i cost this much is because right. when you walk into this room it's the same reason if you were gonna buy a pair of shoes you like what why should i pay two g's you know what i'm saying for some kicks it's like give me a reason to pay two g's for a kick so like i really think it's like that tension of of the possibility of like getting booed off the stage, you know what I'm saying, is like a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, like just a uh, experiencing good performance, right? Yes. So, so, so speaking of the talent buyer, um, Adam. So propaganda and Webby, they talked about like creating a demand, right? And 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 you're kind of the one that's that's booking talent, you know, for a venue. How do you how do you understand that demand? What does that what does that mean to you? Um, how do you approach it? Um, you know, from your perspective, in terms of like like, so, like like locals or national artists. Um, I guess both. I mean, I'm sure we have artists that are tuning in that want to perform more locally, and then that want to perform. I mean, I would imagine that that the formula would be similar. So you might teach me a few things right now. Um, but when you're looking for an artist to book, what are you looking for? Um, I mean, the first thing I'm going to look at is their history in the market and what they've done in the past. Um, like Webby, I had him in early October on a Sunday night and he nearly sold out the other side. Um, but I looked at his history and, you know, he had, he had a sold out show on 420 in April and some other history before that. And he's also with, you know, um, a credible agency. Um, people I've worked with a bunch of times that have a history of selling me winners, just like Adler. And, uh, you know, so that's one thing. The other thing you would look at is, you know, all the social media numbers, YouTube views, you or Facebook likes, you know, Twitter followers, whatever it is. And it's not just the volume, but it's also like the, the fan engagement. Like, are they actually like responding to these posts? Are they liking and sharing? What are they saying? And, you know, every time Dizzy makes a post, it's like immediately like 10,000 likes and God knows how many comments and God knows how many shares. You know, you can tell that the fans are really connecting with the artist and that there is a buzz there. And that regardless of what happens with the show, it's a good investment because it's going to grow in the future in the market. Right. Well, I think a lot of artists don't understand is like this is a business, right? So if you want to perform in a market, you got to be able to sell tickets. You know, if Absolutely. you want to, you want to get. It seems simple. It seems like a very simple concept. I think some artists don't typically grasp it, um, and then they can also get confused because, like, you know, the social media numbers is great. You know, that's a, it's a great metric, and 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 they're real. Um, but even if you have, even if I can, even if you have five hundred people in Denver that have clicked the like button, it doesn't necessarily mean five hundred people will come to a show. Absolutely not. Um, probably a very small percentage of that. <laughs> very small. A very small percentage of that will actually come to a show. Um, you know, so I, I think that a lot, a lot of times artists kind of miss that. It's just like, I need to be on the road. I need to be on the road without creating the demand that you guys are, are talking about. Because our, our experience was similar. Like we, we did most of, like we, we, ne we never had the opportunity or never had the budget to tour to build a fan base, right? We had to build our fan base online, create demand and, and get people comfortable 
investing in us and then we were able to, to yeah to which is uh the other thing that i wanted to touch on um I, you know a lot of people like you know jump way too early at trying to do shows and they want to do shows and all these locals they just want to keep playing shows and playing shows and it's like yo fucking forget about playing shows you know concentrate on making the best music you can and the best content you can to put it out creatively you know visual content videos <clears throat> and, and, and the best way to release it is you know blogs your friends or your, yeah. your fans and if the music is good enough and creative enough it's going to spread organically and yeah. then you know let the promoters and the other artists and agents and people come to you and once they once that starts happening then you'll know that you have something and that's yeah. when it's you know, like, and meanwhile, during that whole time, practice and watch other performers and, you know, yeah. stand in your room in front of a mirror and, and figure right. out, you know, how to put on the best show and, you know, take notes from everyone else who's killing it on stage. You know, I can't right. tell you how many shows that, um, of Method Man shows I've done where other artists watch them, including Macklemore. Like, I mean, Macklemore got the whole walking on the crowd thing from Method Man watching them in Colorado with me. Um, so, you know, that's, uh. So, so Matt, want to loop, want to bring you into this discussion because a lot of times artists hit me up and they're like, "Dame, all I need is a booking agent. And it's gonna be a wrap." <laughs> um, you know. So, how how do they find a booking agent, or when when do you feel like an artist is at a point that they actually need a booking agent? What did you see in in us when you reached out a few years ago? Um, like, how does that initial interest? even happen or what are you looking for well i think that you know a key in aligning with a booking agent in an ideal world uh would be that the booking agent reaches out to you because they're interested in what you're doing um and in the case of funk volume that's what happened uh you know i, I had learned about hop i started seeing his stuff online and i reached out to you dame and we connected and begin you know began building that way I think that a lot of artists that try to find an agent too soon, like that's the finish line. Like once I have an agent, that's it. I'm good. I'm going to get shows. My career takes off, mm -hmm. you know, or can be seriously mistaken because you have to remember that that agent has a lot of clients that they're working on, uh, you know, a lot of the time. And if you come into that world, uh, if you force yourself into that world at a time when you're not supposed to be there, it's too early. You haven't put in your 10,000 hours, so to speak, you know, you could get, what the labels would call shelved. You know, you could be in a place where the agent's not paying attention to you. And now when you really should be doing what Chris and Prop did at the beginning of their careers, hustling themselves off the ground, you're getting comfortable. So you sit down, you think my show thing is taken care of. You stop practicing your craft. You stop observing what other artists are doing. And, um, you know, that, that could be a demise in itself. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important for artists to remember that it's not the finish line. You know, it, it, I'm supposed to be fuel to the fire that you've already created. You know, you're supposed to be doing your thing. And then a bigger agency like Paradigm, William Moore, CAA, ICM comes in and then uses their resources and their leverage capabilities to help you grow what you're already doing yourself. And Funk Volume, you know, Chris Webby, Propaganda, these are artists that were already well on their way uh, by the time they had people helping them out. Um, from a show front. As an agent, I am looking for those fires. So I'm looking for what you guys are doing respectively on, on your end. You know, I'm looking for the social media numbers used to mean everything. I mean, if somebody had 100,000 Facebook fans, 50,000 Twitter followers, you might sign them because of that. You know, now you're looking for a whole lot more. I'm looking for history. I'm talking to people like Adam all day. You know, he's saying, Hey man, there's this kid split out in Boulder. Hey man, there's this kid, you know, soul out in Seattle. You got to check him out. You know, I'm looking for what is out there and what's going on. And um, ideally, you know, trying to enter these respective artists' careers when they are in that place that it's ready to move on and, and it's ready, um, you know, to, to be assisted to, to get to the next level. Right. So a, a lot of a lot of the artists that are that are watching now are kind of in, in the beginning phases and they're trying to mm -hmm. figure they're trying to figure shit out. Um, paying to get on shows or selling tickets to get on shows. I need people's perspective. Where everybody's shaking their head no at the same time. Prop, what? <laughs> I don't know. What? what uh, dude. I I think it. There's two things that it's a reflection of to me, and and Adam, maybe you can um. You can you can attest to this. To me, it's it's the sign of a, a of an uninvested promoter. Like you're 
I feel like that promoter's not invested in the event, um, nor do they care about how it's billed. It's just like, I have, I have no interest in this act. It's just if you can get 40 other people in this building, then cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and uh, so there's no there's no belief. There's no desire. Like, the way that both Adam and Matt have spoken, like, there's an investment in the people that they put in their rooms. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I believe in this. You know what I'm saying? So that's not a win. That person doesn't believe in it. And it says a lot about your headliner in the sense that that dude shouldn't need me to sell tickets for him. You know what I'm saying? Um, it shouldn't, I should just add to what they're doing. And then, and then third, it's just, it just cheapens your brand. It just, it, it's like, it's almost like, I, I felt like it was, I like, it's like I'm prostituting. Like, I'm like, this cheapens my brand. If I'm gonna sell a ticket, it's because this is my tour. This is my core fan base. This, I'm reaching my brand champions that said, when I saw propaganda on this flyer, I'm coming to see him. You know what I'm saying? So that's my investment. I broke bread for this event. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to reap the rewards for hustling for these tickets. And it's just, I just, I just feel like it's like, it's prostitution. I want to jump in and say this. Um, paying to get on a show or a tour is nothing that you should ever do. Um, I've, I've never taken money from an artist and I've never also not paid an artist for performing. However, <clears throat> when it comes to being a local artist, I'll gladly give them tickets to hand sell. Um, it lets me know. <clears throat> it, lets, it lets me know what their value is in the market, and if they're actually bringing people out. I mean, the idea is to is to find someone who is not only going to comp complement the show well, but they're going to actually promote and bring people. Mm -hmm. And you know, if they're if they're pushing to their friends and their fans and like, hey, I have tickets, come buy a ticket from me. They come back and like, hey, Adam, I sold fifty tickets, and be like, motherfucker, that's awesome. You did your job, you performed, you brought people to the show, like that's, that's the whole idea, right? You know, my job is to sell tickets and to put together the best show that I can in as many markets as I can across, across Colorado and sell them all out. Um, so, you know, the, the, the locals a lot of times for certain shows are absolutely 100% necessary to, uh, to really get the word out to mm. certain people that might not be looking in the right places to buy tickets to a show that they might want to go to. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I'm like, are you living under a rock? How'd you not know this was happening? Two chains at Cervantes in two weeks. How'd you not know that? Sure. But I think, I think that, um, I also know that the, the markets in LA and, and Denver are very different too. Like, I don't, Oh, yeah. very different. Very, yeah, very, I was very like, different. I was, I was, I was going to say, I was like, what, what you described actually right. sounded great. You know what I'm right. saying? And and would gladly do that, you know what I'm saying? But like I can actually offhand, being from LA, think of about three dudes that um will remain nameless, but were were very like it was just it was just shady business, like with these dudes and their their pay to play models and was just like for me, it's just it just really put a bad taste in my mouth, which but I think like like you said, like obviously if, if it was Denver and the way that you described it where it's like, yo, are right, you a local cat? Let me give you a shot. You know what I'm saying? Here's 10 tickets. You know what I mean? Like to me, it's like, oh, that's, that's great. Okay. I'm going to show you. I'm going to sell 20 of them. You know what I mean? I think that that's a different scenario than my experience. It's different when you have to actually pay for the tickets that the promoter's giving you. Yeah. That's, 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 pay for that's that. my experience. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you know yeah, yeah. The tickets and they bring us back the dead tickets and the money. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, they, and then they get paid. Perfect. Right. Yeah. No, that was my experience where it's like, yo, here, buy 40 tickets. Yeah, that happened to me. Sell those. And I'm like, uh, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's yeah. I mean, I, I can honestly, so I'm, I'm from the LA area as well. And I can honestly say I don't have a relationship with any LA talent buyer the way I have with Adam. It's a, when we started out, there were, a, we played the game a few different times and we, we quickly realized that selling tickets was a waste of time because of, of the promoters didn't, they weren't trying to build with you. They yeah. were trying, they were trying to take advantage of you. Um, and we would sell our tickets. We would go to the show. They would put us on hella early. We would perform in front of the 20 people that we sold tickets to. We wouldn't get access to any, any, anybody else's fans. And you preach a waste, day. Yeah. And it was a waste, it was a waste of time. So we did that a couple of times and we're like, nah, this sucks. The only time that we're going to get on stage is if it's a contest. Cause I know that Hobson and Swizz have a great show. We'll win the money and get out of there. Like that, that's the only time that we did shows after a couple, you know, ticket selling, uh, disaster. Yeah. Um, I can comment on that too. Like as an agent, when a promoter 
tells me that that's their game plan. You know, we'll put some locals on this thing. We'll give them tickets to sell and, and we'll make it work. You know, I know a guy in LA that does that. It, that I, that's a no, no, I don't, I don't engage in business with those people. I mean, then it's no longer about the show. It's about, let's figure out how to scheme the openers and the fans for money. Mm -hmm. Get the headliner X amount. The way we get him X amount is we put the burden on these openers to sell some tickets. They bring in the revenue. Nobody actually cares about seeing them, or they might only see the opener and not stay for the headliner. It's a bad show. Bad look. You want to scheme for something, look good on paper, and it doesn't add any value to an artist's career. That's and always it. shitty, too, when, when the openers will leave um, before the headliner comes on, and that kind of touches back on what we were talking about earlier, how important it is to watch other artists' stage show. When I see an opener, you know, kind of leave, like, they think they're fly, they don't give a shit, they don't, they don't want to see Chris Webby. It's like, dude, like you are the opener like you could have taken some pointers tonight and just watched my stage show and you know i've been doing this for five years six years you know um you should have stuck around and, and just observed if anything you don't even have to be a fan of the music out of, out of respect period just yeah like, agree agree and like and like i want to build like i want to you know yeah, what I'm saying? like you come to a new city it's like yo there's some new young talent out here like i want to be homie you know what i'm saying like yep. like let's you know like it's hip-hop like let's enjoy ourselves yeah dude absolutely but the relationships that, are key, like making those important. friendships. You never know who's going to be doing what at what point in your life, and they can come back and help you. You never know. You never know. You never so know. Like, yeah, I mean, CEO CEO everybody. Yeah. yeah, so like when a, when a small like indie label out in the Valley has like two artists, and they want to start learning how to tour, and he just calls you out the blue, and you're like, yeah, dude, yeah, let's talk about touring, and it turns out it's funk volume, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Glad I wasn't a jerk, you know? <laughs> Nah, I mean, just one second. Thank you, thank you. Okay. No, relation relationships are are crucial. I mean, we'll just get some room service. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We got lunch. Got a nice little salad, some soup. <laughs> Do your thing. No, relationships are crucial. I mean, you know, Matt, Adam, Webby, you guys already knew each other. I'm not sure if Propaganda was familiar with anybody else on on the panel, but I'm sure going forward, you guys. Sure. It's a very, it's a very small circle. Yes. Of, of artists and people that support artists that are really making moves you know you run in you run into the same people all of the time so it is important to leave a good impression i saw that time and time again like when we would do a show like the openers would leave and i'm like why are you leaving you know well, i didn't ask them I, I didn't really care you know but it's a very bad move just not even just from no standpoint but just from yeah I think it says a lot. It says a lot about that artist in that, like you, you there's a there's a level of like you know you get what you can, you take what you can or you get what you can take or whatever you can get like you take it, but then there's like, are you thinking about your own branding and like, I want to be if I'm gonna open for someone, it's like this is someone that I'm hoping to be somehow tied to like that what they're doing kind of matches a trajectory of where I'm trying to go. So so if I'm opening for this guy, like I'm trying to stay because like these the audience he has is the audience I desire. You know what I'm saying? So like I need to know and like I said, like in the same way that if I have an opener, I'm trying to connect with little homie, like I'm gonna do the same with him and like hopefully, you know, sometimes you find out that he's a jerk and then other times you find out like oh it's like that fool's like he's like a cool he's just like a cool dude you know what i'm saying and you end up building like better friendships i always try to take note of the openers who um captivate the crowd and or bring out a substantial amount of people more than yeah. um you would expect because yeah. uh that's something to take note of you know i was one yeah. of those people um at other people's shows i remember bringing out more people than the headliner on a couple occasions in connecticut when i was first coming up and uh, you know that's it's definitely something that a headliner will notice. So stick right. around for the show. Don't be an asshole. You know, right. say word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys are very cool, and there's a lot of cool artists out there. I don't want to set the expectation that every headliner <laughs> is going to watch you perform. Like I try to watch all the the the, the headliners on our shows. Um, you know, but you just never know. You don't. You never yeah. know who's watching. I usually know. miss him too because I get there late. But I'm just saying, if you hear word of mouth like, "Yo, this dude killed it," you know, that's something. Right. Just you know, <laughs> when you're on tour, dar, you know, I get there maybe like 15 minutes before I go on. And it's just right. like, that's how it is. Like, right. Showering and traveling and eating. And 
But every but everybody's constantly talking. Everybody, especially if your yeah. name is getting out there, you know, they're talking. Hopefully, it's good things, but bad things spread as well. So you yeah. just want, to, you know, keep a positive reputation. Can so, I tell you what? I, if I find out the this promoter was like, rather than doing like a door split, they're gonna do a guarantee. So if you're gonna do a guarantee. And like Matt was saying, and this person's guarantee was contingent on whether these openers sold tickets, then I'm like, I don't trust you. Uh, it's like, I have no reason to ever work with this dude again. Cause I don't, you, you guaranteed something you don't have. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's not a guarantee. If that, if that's the case, then just we'll do a door split. You keep the bar, I'll do it. Like we'll figure out something else, but don't promise something you're not sure you can deliver. Right. Right. So, so kind of, Going back a little bit, at, at what point, and this for the this for the artists, at what point in your career, like, were you, were you like, okay, now I should be getting paid for shows? Like, what were the signs that you say, okay, like, I deserve to be getting paid for shows now? Like, what did that look, what, what did that look like, Chris? Go, you go ahead and start. I remember um, the particular instance. Uh, it was my first show at Toad's Place, which is, you know, the most notable Connecticut venue, which is kind of like my home base from that point forward. And it was a showcase, um, and the radio station hosted it. I don't think they were expecting much out of it, um, but I brought out about, probably at the time, 50 people, and this is like early 2009. And from that point forward, everyone kind of at least took a little bit of note and i was like damn I, I should be you know getting paid for this maybe you know at least for the on the at least be opening for you know legit artists of course you got to start on the small uh small scale i did like went to the pyramid club a few times in new york city if you're not familiar that's like a legendary spot where you could just like hop on stage get in a cypher you know grab the mic from someone and, and just do a little spitting but there is a point where i mean you need to make a living off of it and you need to just know when you do have a price and don't try to you know have a price before you're ready because then you're yeah. just like a dickhead <laughs> I also don't think yeah. there should ever really be a price because everything varies per market. Of course. Size of, course. of venue, yeah. ticket price. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's there's so many factors that go into it. So, you know, a lot of the artists that are like, yup, uh, I'll go on the road. And, you know, the, the agent's like, yo, I want to sign you and book you a tour. Um, I won't say any of the artists' names, but they're like, yo, we can't take less than 10K. It's like, well, you just, good luck. Night, night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My price, yeah. you know, I, I won't throw any specific numbers out, but it definitely varies throughout the country, as I would imagine most yeah. artists do. Unless yeah, yeah. There's, there's it, depends on it might be worth 60 tickets and some markets where you might be worth a thousand tickets. And you just got to know, like, how you're supposed to build those markets. You know, instead, you know, in, in, those, in those markets where you suck, take an opening slot and take shit money to get in front of a big crowd. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think, even this is a good point to talk about the difference between, like, hard ticket sales and, like, and uh, soft ticket sales, yeah. So like, if for me in a situation where this is a built-in audience and it's like a soft prop, ticket sale, prop, prop, prop. So, hold on one second. Some people yeah. might not, might not know the difference between. Uh, okay, so so hard ticket sales is basically your name on a flyer. It's ten bucks to get in. They're coming to see you. That's a hard. So like he said, when he goes into a market, if I if if propaganda goes to Denver, I would hit up somebody like Adam or my manager would and be like, Yo, here's our matrix. You know what I'm saying? Here's our sales, our ticket sales history. You know what I'm saying? Um, we sold these many people. We got this many people on our on our mailing list. I say in a 30 mile radius, there's these many people in the zip code that we have access to that have bought tickets already. Here you go, right? And then so he'll project out like, oh, okay, we can get this many people in the building. We'll say, hey, uh, we'll do. Uh, we always do door splits. We just feel like it's the fairest thing. Um, so we'll do in that situation. We'll just do a door split or buy out the room, whatever the case may be, that's a hard ticket sale where I could say, my name was on the flyer, people bought this. A festival soft, would be a soft ticket when there's like- a Festival of soft ticket sales where it's a billion people, they're coming anyway, you know what I'm saying? And you're just like, you're, it's built in, right? It's a built in audience. So in a built in audience situation, I think it's like, that's where we're like, yo, this is like, this is, this is my price, you know what I'm saying? But on a hard ticket sale thing, it's like, no, you just gotta hustle. You know, and that that's going to vary. But I think for me, I started noticing it was like it was put on me. It was I had I was I did like a quick little run with like KRS and De La Soul's most amazing thing. I was nerding out the whole time. But uh, 
at the end, but in, in my brain, it was still like, I'm still just grinding. Like, this is like, I had no idea anyone was paying any attention to me anyway. You know what I'm saying? But it was when the next buyer called and was like, hey, would you accept this amount of money? Like, I know it's kind of on the low end, but you accept it. And my response was like, uh, yeah, let's talk. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to, I'll talk to management and see if that's okay. You know, it was like the most money I was ever offered for a show. You know what I'm saying? So it was like once the, 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 the audience or the, the, the demand was there. So they, they had this perceived value of me that I didn't know was there. So once that started happening, I was like, oh, so, oh, so I can, I can charge for shows like for real, you know? So it was kind of like, it was kind of, it was like backwards for me. And I was like, oh, I guess I should start. Cause you, you believe I'm worth this. So right. I should start carrying myself like I am. Right. Right. No. Um, cool. So we're about 40 minutes in. I want to, I want to leave some time for some, some live Q and A's. Um, yeah. so Chad and Brooklyn, they're the ones that are kind of like running it from a technical perspective. So Chad and Brooklyn, can you <coughs> do an A session? See if Yo, we can get, get a few. I know, man. Twitter's really blowing up with this, man. This is super dope. This is dope. Yeah, I haven't even checked my shit. Yeah, I just it's it's sitting it. right next to me. It's like going yeah. crazy right now. No, that's that's cool. I, I think um, I mean, because what, what we're talking about is very is very real. It's very like you guys, you guys actually live this. We live this. You know, we've been where all of these artists are. Um, we know what they're being hit with. We know the truths. We know the lies. Um, you know, so as long as we have a very real dialogue, I think it works. Um, so it looks like we have uh, Pedram. Yeah, what's up, guys? Uh, I just have a question. Oh, that's so dope. You can talk like the thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of fresh. I thought we were just going to read the questions. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, but if I just like, if you don't have your own studio, uh, like, do you have to look for a producer or should you build your own? Oh, so this isn't a, this isn't a, a no, show no. question. Um, so maybe we could just answer this one real quick and then we just encourage yeah. um, everyone else to ask questions related to um, you know, the live show, but I guess is his question was, if you don't have your, if you don't have your own studio equipment, should you, should you build your own? How should you go about like get in wherever you can? That's an expensive, uh, investment to start yeah. with. I still yeah. don't have my own studio, so I, I don't I, either. Yeah. Get in where you can and just yeah. make it work. Yeah. And if you're not, if you have no desire to like futuristically go into like engineering and production, like I wouldn't suggest, cause you, you gotta love that. If you're gonna like build a studio, you gotta love recording the process yeah. of engineering. Like yeah. I wouldn't do it. You just want to rap. Like, just find a good engineer. That's like yeah. kind of the most important part. Cool. That's All right. right. Appreciate it, Pedram. I think we have Brandon Bennett on the line as well. Yeah, the question for propaganda. Like, could you Yo. describe some of the lows in that ten-year period? Say yeah, we're doing it like seriously for ten years. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as a, I mean, <laughs> where you want to start? There was, uh, you know, one of my first tours uh, up the road, up going up just the five freeway on the West Coast, you know, from San Diego to Vancouver. The guy, I got, I got dumped on that tour for the guy I was touring with, and uh, so that was that was horrible, you know, and uh, so we, so so she ended up. She ended up dating the guy I was touring with, the lady that just dumped me. I mean, they're married now, which is great now, but like, but at the moment I was like, this is awful. Uh, and that same tour, I came home to like a flooded apartment and my roommate stopped paying rent. So I was, I had to get kicked. I was about to get evicted in four days. So I had to find an apartment, you know, within the next four days at the end of a show that I got dumped on for the guy I was touring with. So there's that. There was uh, times when like just the money didn't add up. I had to paint my mom's garage once. Cause just, I just didn't make enough. There was, uh, there was the, some of the situations before when he was talking about, um, you know, at the end of the day, the end of the event, you know, I mean, the custodian's gone, the bartender's leaving. It's just you and you just sitting around like waiting for someone to hand you your cut. And, and so at, it's two hours later, you just standing there and then the guy finally says, Hey, listen, bro. Yeah. We kind of didn't, you know what I'm saying? And you're just going to let me 
you're just gonna let me stand here the whole time and like yeah. you know so there was there was plenty of those moments you know what i'm saying um getting to the hotel and it's roach infested and just all kind of like crazy things this line of work is full of extreme lows so uh, yeah. if you're planning on going into it get ready for that <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a roller coaster every yeah. day. Like, you know, half the time I'm cheering and half the time I'm ready to jump off a fucking building. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hope that answers. Uh oh. I think I froze up real quick. Um, can anybody hear me? Yep. Yeah, I hear you. Hello. Can anybody hear me? I think I'm frozen. I hear you. Yeah, we we, we can't hear you and see you. It's just fun. It's your. <laughs> we hear you, Dave. Poor guy. Gone. Hey, All right. Ten pound now. So, <laughs> Dave. These chicken tenders are incredible, by the way. <laughs> what city are you in? I just got to Buffalo. We were driving. Um. Shut up. It's called. Isn't it sh shut down? Yeah, they have like they got pretty much um the road on the way here. We were driving in the right lane, and someone was in the left lane, and they slipped, and they swerved right in front of us as we no. were driving. We were, like, looking at the side of their car. It was in, it was crazy. The craziest thing I've ever seen. No. I think I lost you guys for a second, but I'm back. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. So it looks like we have Percy Crosby actually on camera. What's so. up, Percy? Percy. What I have? You got a question? Holla at us, holla at us. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Got a question? Uh, yeah. Um, my question was, what's a good door split? Uh, we've been touring ourselves over the last two, three years, doing smaller venues in small cities throughout the Midwest. So what's, what's a good door split? You know. Adam, you want to work out this deal? Me and you? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, All right. Curse, you want to how go expensive first, yeah, I'll go first. How expensive are the tickets? Uh, the tickets uh, was going for like five bucks. Five bucks. All right. You guys are doing like 200, 300 capacity venues? Yes. All right. Adam, give my guy 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know... When you're dealing with such a cheap ticket, you're going to have to do something from dollar one. Um, you know, I think anything over 60% from a promoter is generous. Um, but, uh, you know, a good deal for you would be between 70 and 80% from dollar one. Um, and, you know, like typically when I do, when I do a door deal with somebody, <clears throat> um, depending, there's a couple different factors. One, are their fans all under 21 or are they going to be 21 plus? Like how how well is my bar gonna do? Um, like that's <clears throat> that's a big thing yeah. to consider when when uh, giving somebody a door deal because I might take a hit on expenses um, just to you know get the show on a good door deal. But um, you know most of the time the idea is to cover all of your expenses, make your promoter profit, get the artist paid, and then give them some back end. So any other extra money made on top, they're taking the majority of. And door deals are funny because door deals aren't like just something that happens at the beginning of your career. There's something that happens throughout your career, depending on what market you're in. So Absolutely. Chris, Rob, they have their strongest markets as artists. They might not be interested in, in a promoter guarantee. They might know what they're capable of and they say, this is my ticket price. and We're going to negotiate the best percentage to me possible. And, you know, Absolutely. guys play Madison Square Garden on door deals. You know, Red I mean, rocks on door deals, you name it. I mean, absolutely. I would half, say the same half, thing. Yeah. Half, half the Red Rock shows are done on door deals. Yeah. Cool, cool. So let me see. Uh, do we have anybody next? We have a, a Joe Morales. Is, is Joe on? Joe Morales? Nope. Maybe. Can you Joe. guys hear me? Yeah, yeah what up, dog? All right, cool. Uh, pretty good, pretty good, man. Uh, thank you guys for this, by the way. Uh, my question is, uh, in regards to shows and performing, what are some key factors or examples that you guys uh, can give me that would um, 
separate someone from a good show, a dope or incredible show, um, like things aside from just grabbing the mic and spitting? What is it that you guys either look for or do that, that stand out so that way you guys can captivate the audience aside from the dope talent? Crowd response. Yeah. Crowd interaction is huge. Interaction. Um, just overall, like I was kind of saying before, just how you command the crowd. Um, and if you really keep them captivated throughout the entire time, yeah. um, then you can get creative with props, with any, anything really. Yeah. Um, there was a tour that I went on the, uh, Webster's laboratory tour, which was a while ago. I was like 40 something stops and I freestyled at every single show. So like that, that was, uh, you know, something that separated, you know, just find ways to separate yourself. Yeah. There's a lot of people doing this right now. And everybody's trying to tour right now, which is, you know, taking money out of everybody's pocket. So you got to show people why your show yeah. is worth, you know, going out to see. Yeah. yeah. Everybody, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody's going to have like a, you have to find like your lane, right? So you have, you can have like a Jay-Z who kind of, he commands the crowd, you know, like no other, but he's not jumping in the state, jumping in the crowd like Hobson or MGK. Like that's their yeah. lane. Like Jay Z yep. does something totally different. Yeah. So I think you have to you have to have a lot of experience. Um, you know, get up there, do the open mics like Propaganda and Chris yep. Webby did. Look for opportunities to get on stage as much as possible, and then try try things. Yeah. You know, try, you know just yeah. just try out trial and error, and and, and get yeah. comfortable up there. And just be be like viciously viciously committed to your own voice and what you are and for me it's like i my strength is i'm a storyteller so when i'm setting up a show it's like i'm thinking about a movie so it's like i'm trying to make the the experience is more like you've watched the like this is theater like you just watch the film you know what i'm saying so when i get you from song a or point a to to, to point b it's like i want you to feel like you went on a journey you know what i'm saying so i had to know that like okay if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna compare myself to someone that's doing some more like just some turn up stuff, then I may look at that and be like, dang, you know, the crowd's not engaged. But that's not my crowd. My crowd are listeners, so they're gonna come in, and when it's time for us to get up, they're gonna get up. But then there's other moments when they're just staring intently. But that's because you're listening. Like I'm telling you a story, and that's that for me. That's how. That's how I captivate. So you got to like just viciously like fight for your own voice and find it. And like Dane was saying, it just takes performing. Just yeah, just the lot. more you do it, you know what I'm saying, you'll find it. And another thing too, there's a huge difference between performing when people don't know your songs and Safe performing word. in front of a crowd of people that know your songs. That changes yeah. the entire dynamic of everything. Yeah. Right. And and. And also, the last thing I will say about this, because I know that our, our guys have done it, like they've, well, at least Swizz for sure, is like he trained his voice. Like he did vocal mm. like exercises. Like it's yeah. very, when you tour night after night or even just one night, like yeah. you're doing a show one night, it, it, it it's very stressful on your voice. It's not normal to just, for a regular person to do a, an hour long set. Um, so, and, and, you know, a lot of times at hip hop shows, like, people don't even know what the hell you're saying. And that's all bad to me. Um, you know, so you want to strengthen your voice so yeah. that even, because in the beginning, you guys might not be at venues that have the best sound systems. Yeah, um, don't blow your voice out. I mean, listen, how I sound, I'm definitely pretty raspy. This is my 12th show consecutively tonight, aside yeah. from the rest of the tour before that. But I mean, that's pretty fucking intense to get up and do this every day and in this weather it's been fucking freezing so that's really uh puts yeah. a strain on your voice and you do have to be conscious of that 100 percent. it's discipline uh, just be yeah. disciplined like exactly. oh, i don't smoke no. weed all day i don't smoke a cigarette all day until after my show there it is you know that i will lose my voice afterwards yeah, who knows discipline. what's gonna happen i'm just still <laughs> extremely hung over from the last night but yeah. Dizzy, um, Dizzy, Dizzy doesn't follow those rules, so I guess whatever works for you, like Dizzy. Exactly, yeah. it's everyone's different. Yeah, everyone's you gotta know you. Like me, I like shoot. I go to bed. Like once the show's done, I'm like, take a shot or two. Night, night. Right. And I have a particular, I have a particular bourbon because I know it's gonna put me to sleep the fastest. <laughs> and it's gonna clean, and it's gonna clean my throat out. I'm like, yo, night. Right, right. <laughs> Cool, cool. I think we have somebody else. Ryan Couture. Hey, 
Ryan, are you there? Ryan. Let me give him a second. Maybe he's just on mute. If we can't get Ryan, let's try to get to the next person. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Wait a few seconds, a little delay. Irv, is Irv on? Irv the Phenom? Yeah, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Irv, what up, man? What up, dude? What up, brother? How y'all doing? What's up? Chilling, chilling. Yeah. Uh, um, and a very experienced artist himself, Herb the Phenom, was good. Yeah. Uh, bless, man. I love what y'all are doing. First off, um, it's very entertaining propaganda. Uh, some of the tour stories you were telling, like, that's real life. <laughs> real, bro. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say, like, uh, a major part of touring that, um, you know, no matter what point you're in is uh, your merchandise. And I was going to say Dame or anybody on the panel, like, as far as your artist merchandise and uh, merchandising ideas. Is there any pointers or tips or um, any, you know, downfalls that you could tell us to avoid or how to improve on? I'm, I'm going to let, I'm going to let, I know Webby and them and his team do a very good job in, in the merchandise, um, in the merchandise area. So Webby, go ahead, man. Take, take that question. Merchandise is huge. Um, when you're an independent artist and realizing that there's only so much money to be made in the actual sale of music nowadays, um, once you have a fan base, merchandise could become one of your biggest sources of revenue, if not really your biggest. Um, I've been doing packages, uh, you know, for the holidays or when a project drops, so you can get like, you know, a gold package, a platinum package with various things. I've got like, probably 15 different t-shirt designs, a bunch of sweatshirts, et cetera. Um, it takes a while to build that. I started with just two designs. Um, but once you have uh, fans that are invested in you as an artist and you as a person and they want to really you know, wear your merchandise, then you can only go up from there. And I highly suggest it because yeah. you know, it's not easy and it takes a while to figure out because as an artist, yeah. like I don't understand how that world works 100%. I do a lot better now. But... Um, it's something that, you know, is definitely worth figuring out. Even if you just got one t-shirt design, you know, for a while, yeah. you just rock with that. It's just good to have something. Yeah. I think it's important to remember, like, like a lot of times because we you, you, you cut down on quality for speed or for uh, quantity. And I think that going back, that was probably my first, like, real mistake was like, I just thought I needed a lot of items, but they weren't quality items. Um, like it wasn't a good t-shirt. Like you're not going to wear this shirt again. You know what I'm saying? Um, so for me, it's like just, and I have like my backgrounds in like design and illustration. That's what I went to school for. So like, so because of that, like me and like the, my label, like we're, we're like brand Nazis. Like just, we're super particular about visual aesthetic and about quality of print and um, the material, like all of that. So I think that in, when you're thinking about apparel, you want to think about something that is not just a show item, but like, yo, if I were to walk into a boutique store, I could see this on, on a shelf there. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that's like super important to remember that like quality is important. Like, will a person wear this again? You know what I'm saying? So if we do seasonal stuff, very similar, like right now, like I, I don't, it would be dumb for Webby right now to be, to have it as merch table tank tops. Like he's in, he's in Buffalo, New York right now. It's like yeah. snow apocalypse. Like why are you carrying tank tops on me? You know what I'm saying? Shirts, you feel that. me? We yeah. got hoodies, we got beanies, you know what I'm saying? So things I mean, like if that. Like, got stock, of course, you know, there's nothing yeah. wrong. Get, get rid of the back stocks. There's some yeah. cycles out there. We'll buy a yeah. job in the middle of a snowstorm. But. <laughs> Somebody will, you know what I'm yeah. saying? But like, but you just, you know, think like that. Think think seasonal. Think like you exactly. are a store. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Like, so they're buying into all that is you. You know what I'm saying? So, like, visually, uh, material, aesthetic, like, all of that. that and, and like Chris said, like, really, that's, I'm, I mean, I'm feeding my children off merch. Right. So, yeah, I mean, even even where we're at, like, I, I think Funk Volume, like, we've done well. We, we've sold a lot of merch, but we're we're now at the point where we're doing kind of what, what propaganda is suggesting, kind of taking a step back, 
stepping up the quality of everything that we're doing, um, you know, and, and, and looking at it more of like a, a clothing line going forward. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, again, we've done well, but I think just now are we able to, we have more resources now. I have more help, you know, because when you're running a label, it's really like five businesses in one. Um, we're able, we have the resources now to kind of focus more on it. And going forward, we will have, you know, better quality things. And then, But then we also have, you know, four different artists, the Funk Volume brand, the four different artist brands, and then we have the Still Moving stuff. So, you know, it, it, takes a t it takes a little time to figure out the merch situation, but it, you yeah. definitely need to figure it out for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to so stay that, afloat financially. Exactly. Yeah. Those uh, are... There's 200 potential billboards. Like every person that's wearing your shirt, that's a billboard. Right. You know, so you need to think, I want, this is going to be somebody's first impression of me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Instead of paying for a billboard, they're paying you to they're be. They're paying you. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, so uh, let's see. I know we got a few more questions. Um, I don't see a new name just yet. Uh, oh, here we go. Dan and Gilbert. Are you there? Dannon? Hey, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right. My question was, as an artist, do you recommend, if you live in a small city, do you recommend growing in your small city or moving to a bigger city to try to grow in a bigger city? Oh. I, I'll feel that you're from a big city. So that as far as uh, Connecticut is not, is like a state, but it's kind of, I would say like a small city market, uh, at least it's viewed that way. Stay there, get buzzed there, but you got to move out and get to one of the meccas to really like start spreading things. That's just point blank. Yeah. I, think, I, I think everybody's going to have a different perspective on, on this one, depending on, on where you're from. Like, cause exactly. Hobson, yeah, because Hobson definitely wasn't popping locally. Like we did shows all over the world and people didn't even know he was from LA. Um, with the internet now, you have the ability to not have to physically move. You know, you can sure. virtually target people in a specific city um, very easy without being there. Um, so I definitely don't think you have, it's great if you can cultivate a local following and build that type of momentum. That's awesome. Uh, we weren't able to do that or we didn't do that. Um, Matt, it looked like you were about to say something. What are, you, what are your opinions on it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's like what Chris said. It's about, a, you know, at the right time, you do need to move on and, and try to get out of where you're from. I mean, Adam, you see guys, I'm sure, in Denver that, you know, all they're doing is just opening show after show after show after show. Um, you know, I, I think that what we spoke about earlier in the panel about focusing on your music and building your foundation before you get out there and, you know, uh, start to tour is the most important. But when you are ready to tour, you know, it was important for Chris to say, all right, you know, I could play Toads twice a year or I could play Toads twice a year and then try this in New York City and try it in Virginia, try it in Baltimore, try it in D.C. And you, you were know, there that whole, that whole process. You, you witnessed it happening, you know. And that was, yeah. 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 You know, it could feel great to sell a thousand tickets to Toads in December and not so great to sell a hundred tickets in Virginia, but you got to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah but that's a hundred, but that's a hundred tickets in another city. And right. that's a win. That's a win. If you're a local cat, you've never left the city, dog. If you could, if you could sell any tickets in a place they ain't never heard of you, you're, that's a win. You know, at some point, you know, you, you gotta like, I, I agree. It's like, it, it depends on, it depends on the market. Like they're, some small markets are great places to cultivate, like, because one could argue that, like, just by by virtue of of humans per square mile, that Oakland is a small market, you know, by virtue of just size of city and the amount of people. However, you got half of your slang, you got Oakland to thank for it. You know what I'm saying? So, like, there's it depends on what do you mean by small market. You know what I'm saying? And then. Like both of them were saying, at some point you gotta like you gotta get out the pond, and if you don't leave the pond, like you'll really never know if you can actually swim in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, but be okay with the fact that like yo at at home, at home you was filling up the venues. Just know it's not gonna be the same when you leave, and just have the same patience and the same 
day. Like even like the tour tour I just finished. It's like you go to one city and it's like they had to turn away a hundred people. The very next city <laughs> was thin. You know what I'm saying? And it's just it's just a part of touring. But yeah, you know, just it, the point is diligence. I think. Right. Whether it's but, local or right. on the road, the point is diligence. And I have like the most love and the most hate in Connecticut. So, wow. I mean, like, the too strong, you know, is a lot of artists deal with that. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, Jaron Benton, for example, he lives in Atlanta. His music doesn't really subscribe to what is really popping in Atlanta. And, but yeah. he does, he, he does shows elsewhere. You know, everybody wants, everybody wants home support. That's great. But at the end of the day, you're, that's one city amongst thousands of cities around the world. Yeah. You don't um, need it. You don't yeah. need it. Yeah, just nice go where the fish are biting. Yeah. Just go where the fish are biting. You know what I mean? If there's, if there's demand, go. Right. Exactly. Cool. Good question. Um, let's field one more. Um, I don't see a name. I haven't seen a name pop up just yet. Oh, yes, I do. Zach Lauer. Are you there? Zach, you there? Zach? What's up, Zach? <laughs> Zach, give you a few more seconds to get on. We might have to get to somebody else. Hey, by the way, y'all are cool as hell, man. Like, I can't believe it. For sure. I like everybody here. I like every last one of y'all. This has been a good time. Yeah, I man. A, I was a little jealous when Adam when, when Adam got that random back rub. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, time out. Like, <laughs> My girlfriend's right here, too. I'm not getting any back rubs. <laughs> <laughs> you got to talk about it right after this panel, Matt. You guys got to have a discussion. All right, <laughs> uh, come on. I know we got at least one more question. Let's see. Hello. Adam. Adam. Hey, Cod Adam Cod uh, you can just call me by my fucking rap name, aka the Joker. It's all good. Uh, okay. So. AK. Yep. AK. Hey. So I was wondering. Well, I don't really have anything to do for a live performance. But what would you say concerning, like, uh, fuck, I had the right phrasing a second ago. Kind of just has to do with the, oh, yeah, yeah. So a performance via a music video. Like, before I start having actual shows, I would think that I should probably have, like, a music video so people can have an idea of like how I'd look like doing a little performance, right? To an extent, I mean, music videos are performing your music if it's a performance-based music video. Um, but at the same time, it's a totally different. Being yeah, that was an art camera is different. Yeah, but yeah. I would I would find it I would find it very hard to believe that there's an artist that has demand for a show if you didn't have music videos out. I did. It was crazy. Really? I didn't have a music video until like my fifth mixtape. <laughs> but you could still pull out. How did people know about you? Step if. Wow. That's it's crazy. like the actual projects. Yeah, it was a different time for sure. That's like, crazy. Uh, yeah. Um, but it's, it's apples and oranges. Like essentially it's apples and oranges. Yeah, like, both fruit, but. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it helps create. But I'm saying like the videos for us, like that is what created the demand. Right, that is what created the connection. I mean, the music and, and the visuals. If we didn't have the visuals, I don't know if there enough demand would have been created to eventually tour. Oh, of course, of course. No, visuals yeah. are are crucial. I like freestyle videos and shit too. That was kind of my supplement for actual music videos because I couldn't afford making them. So, uh, but see, that, kind of, but see if, if you're doing like if you're talking about like a freestyle video, it it um, it's it's kind of showcasing the fact like it was a performance. You know yeah, what I'm for sure, for uh, sure, yeah. But the the, it's still, the, than the stage. it's still a different thing in the sense that like there's no there's less risk behind a camera because no one can throw a beer bottle at you. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like so there's really no I feel like there's really no replacement. Or there's no there's no there's no replacement, you know what I'm saying? And just because you have a great video doesn't necessarily mean you can perform well. 
Right. And just because you can perform well doesn't necessarily mean you'll have great music videos. So I think that there's, there, it's, there are two muscles that they, you should definitely be firing on both cylinders, but I wouldn't see the two as step ladders, if you will. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Right. I mean, I, 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 think, we're, I think we're just on, on different wavelengths because the way I'm saying is like that's how, that's how, like the music video is how we created the demand for a promoter to say, oh shit, look how many views, look how many people are commenting. Yeah. Like they must be able to bring people out, you know? Um, so it's more of a promotional thing. Where um, I think he was saying more like the way you perform in a video. Yeah, that's what I'm how that to would say. translate yeah. to how that's you perform point. on stage. Yeah. That's my point. Because, like, because nowadays, especially videos yeah. is and good videos. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And, and, and Hobson and Swiss, like your team could, they could perform their tails off. So it's like, Y'all already knew how to perform, you know? Right. So I thought if I was understanding the question right, it was like, will these music videos help my live performance? And what I'm saying is not necessarily. Right, I got you, I got you, 100%. All right, fellas, this was another great discussion. I appreciate you guys joining, oh, wow. uh, you guys definitely fam. Do you guys have, I'm, let me just go through each one of you guys, maybe just some final words, um, propaganda starting with you. Yeah, uh, stay hungry, stay humble, and just grind. Slow cook, tortoise wins. Yep, yep, Thanks, Dane, for having us. This was Thanks, definitely man. fun. Um, I hope everyone got to take away some uh, good info and and learned a few things. Yeah, thank you, Dame. I thought this was great. And uh, you know, just remember to work on you before you, you start working with other people. That would be my advice. And be true to yourself, always. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm a product of what we're talking about right now. You know, I'm out here in the trenches and, you know, it ain't easy, boys and girls, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. And uh, being on stage is one of the best feelings in the fucking world. So give people a reason to put you on that stage, you know? Well, thanks again, fellas. Um, if you guys are tweeting about the conference, please use the hashtag FVHHC. Again, it's hashtag FVHHC. And there'll be a one hour break now, and then we will be back at one o'clock um, PST with um, the YouTube panel, how to build a YouTube audience with Hobson, Wax, Prince E, and Jacob Owens. So thanks again, fellas, and I'll see everybody else in about an hour. Peace. I'm about to eat these okay. chicken tenders like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs>